Hi, I'm Leopoldine Kaur. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to be reading the end of a pretty new story. It's called The Trip, and it's about a married couple, two academics in their 60s, Henry and Susan, who are headed to Missoula, where one of them has been invited to teach for the semester. And just every horrible thing has happened. They crashed their van and became really frightened, too frightened to drive it. So at this point they've paid someone to drive it and they're on a bus, which is gonna take them to a plane, which is gonna take them to Missoula. And at this point in the story, they've switched seats because they were sitting in front of someone who was talking to themselves um, in a way that was sort of frightening. That was so scary, Susan said in a low voice. I know, Henry said. I didn't think it was bothering you till you grabbed me. You were so quiet, Susan said. I was listening to him. I wanted to hear exactly what he was saying. Henry blinked reflectively. He said something about a sword. He did? That's when I grabbed you. God, it must be like a radio station in your head. Right, Henry sniffed. I immediately thought of that guy who murdered the kid on the bus. Susan stared into Henry's face, dark with flashes of streetlight rushing over it. What guy who murdered the kid on the bus? It was like two years ago. The guy decapitated this kid on a Greyhound bus. You remember? No, I do not remember. Well, I don't want to scare you. You're already scaring me. Okay, forget it. They sat quietly a moment. Henry closed his eyes. Susan sat up and looked nervously behind her chair but it was too dark to see if the man was walking toward them with a sword. All right, she whispered slowly as she sat back down, irked by the curiosity Henry had planted. So, how did he cut off the head? Henry roused with a sniff. What? How did he cut off the head? She repeated a bit loudly. Oh, he had some sort of butcher knife, I think. And he just attacked this very young kid out of nowhere. He said a voice told him to. God, Susan said. Everyone got off the bus and they locked the doors somehow with him in there. Henry rubbed his eyes. And he just ran up and down the aisle carrying the head. Okay, enough. You asked me. Susan looked up at the yellow moon. She put her hand to her heart and, feeling its speed, she drew it away. At just past midnight, they arrived in Milwaukee and took a cab to the airport. At a tiny table, Henry ate a dry turkey sandwich, sulkily examining it between bites. I'm so starved for seasoning, he said. We're starved, period, Susan said. Henry stared at her. Do you want some coffee? No, more coffee might push me into another dimension. Henry laughed. He finished the sandwich with one last dissatisfied bite. Then they walked to the gate and waited. Susan put her head in Henry's lap. I'm so weary, she croaked. I think you told me that, Henry grinned. Oh, shut up, she said, and quickly fell asleep. Henry watched a pair of young girls a few feet away. One had a head of short platinum curls, the other a long goldish braid. They sat cross-legged on the gray rug facing each other, slouched over two separate piles of candy. They were trading. Their parents sat nearby, mutely pawing their phones. Henry wondered what sort of people gave their kids candy before boarding an evening plane. He watched as one girl, the one with the long braid, handed a Tootsie Roll to the other. She was compensated with a fat-headed lollipop. Fascinated, he watched a few more trades pass in the same girl's favor. Henry went from admiring her skills of manipulation to actually sort of feeling sorry for the one with the curls. Maybe she's a little younger, he thought and decided she was being taken advantage of. Look, he said to Susan, patting her shoulder. They're trading. Susan opened her eyes only slightly. That one's hoarding all the good stuff, he said. It's breaking my heart. Susan's yawn curled up into a cat-like smile. Cheapness is expressed through candy at that age, she said and coughed, clearing the sleep from her voice. It's the money of childhood. Henry nodded, grinning. They watched as the girls ate from their two separate piles, then stumbled around in spacey states of bliss. Kids are such drunks, Henry whispered. Staggering and gleeful, Susan added. When they were called to board, Susan groaned. Can I crawl? Come on, love, he said. 
and it was a surprising relief to enter the familiar capsule to know that now nothing was expected of them. Even the liftoff was pleasant, easy to succumb to. They simply sat there, letting the rumbling machine have them, then the sky. Susan looked down at the blinky orange lit city. How beautiful and monstrous, she thought. She imagined the land below them 200 years ago, just dark and trees, a canoe riding by. Look at it down there. It's so endless, she said to Henry. Civilization, it only grows. Well, yes and no, he said. There are things like blackouts that give you a little taste of what's possible. It's all so fragile, really. Susan nodded with a hum and leaned her head against his shoulder. I love the way you smell, he said and she smiled. It was the smile of someone who would never in her lifetime tire of flattery. And how is that, she gleamed. Henry gave her hair a deep theatrical sniff. Like bread, he said, and the ocean. To this she laughed uproariously, not because it was particularly funny, but because it felt good. I love your mind, she said, in an underwater way, nodding off on his shoulder. It kicks up a beautiful pearl once in a while, Henry said, calmly grinning, though his shoulder hurt like hell. Susan, he said, gently, kissing the top of her head. Susan, but she was asleep. Thank you. so much to the Center for Fiction for this whole program and for organizing this tonight and um, to everyone for coming out. Um, this is an excerpt from a newer project I have. It's a spy novel. Um, it's set in Argentina in 1966 and um, in this scene a woman, an American woman who's um, spying in Argentina is meeting someone in a park to discuss bugging an office. I arrived at the plaza first, found a bench, and did a preliminary check. I counted the people who were stationary within 20 yards of where I sat. There were 14. I took stock of how many were standing, and how many were sitting, how many in groups, and how many alone. Did any of them look familiar? Two women on a bench with a baby I dismissed immediately, along with a pair of teenagers creeping their hands under each other's shirts. A priest on a bench with his eyes closed caught my attention for a minute, but there was a white thread of saliva hanging from his lip, vibrating when he snored. A man in a pink shirt and a chocolate brown tie loitered near the rose bushes along Avida Rivadavia, sunglasses on, sweat stains spreading from beneath his arms. If Nico had someone following me, it would be him. I watched him check his watch a few times, pick at his nails, bend to tighten the laces on his shoes. Ten minutes went by before I realized that he was loitering there for the purpose of watching the teenagers on the bench. The girl with her skirt hiked up and her legs slung over the boy's lap. The boy rubbing her ankle under its white sock with a kind of fixed hysteria. The man was surveilling, but not in a professional capacity. I turned to my newspaper again. Nico materialized from the knot of traffic on the far side of the square at 7.15 and made his way toward me slowly, smiling, fanning himself with his hat. He was flushed, his skin pink against a dark mustache, and he was squinting across the raised dust of the square as if there were no person on earth he could be more delighted to see than myself. When he stopped in front of my bench, he put the hat on for a moment, only so he could doff it with a gentlemanly sweep of his hand. This weather is like standing in a puddle of piss, he said. Buenos tardes, he said. I watched his eyes move over my head to the glare of Rivadavia behind me, where the man in the brown tie was still standing in his voyeuristic stupor by the rose bushes. He's harmless, I said, unless he's yours. Nico gave a generous laugh and slumped down beside me on the bench, which creaked. His trousers made the zip zip sound of nylon. Someone has painted Evita Vive on the ass of that statue, he said, pointing to a bronze casting of the thinker, streaked white with pigeon shit. I laughed. Nico spread his arms along the back of the bench and, cle and cleared his throat, turning abruptly toward business. I've been thinking about Vice President Perret, he said. 
You can't get into his office with some bullshit about the phone lines because he has them all checked every two months. We may have to give him a gift instead, some new furniture, a picture for his wall. He checks his phone lines, but not his furniture, I said. Phone lines are suspicious by their nature, Nico said. Furniture is not. I laughed again. A flower seller appeared suddenly, proffering a basket of single roses, apparently sensing a smoldering romance between Nico and me. I waved her away. It will be an English landscape drawing, he said. Beautiful, signed, original. It would be damaged terribly if anyone were to take the, ba the backing off the frame. I laughed. That's a pretty simple trick. Nico said, sometimes the simplest ones are the best. Thank you. Um, and to all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Um, trying to get this in a way that's like not totally awkward. Um, so I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a novel that I'm working on right now. Um, and what's happening is the narrator is living in San Francisco and the mother uh, keeps visiting her in San Francisco because she's house hunting. My car didn't sound good. After my mother and I had dinner in Pacific Heights, we were heading back to my apartment when the engine started sputtering and wheezing like an old man with emphysema. The arrow on the temperature gauge trembled threateningly in the red danger zone. I let the car coast to the side of the road into a parking spot parallel to the curb. The car shuddered, then died. I felt relieved that we hadn't broken down on a hilly street. I dialed the number for road service, described to the guy on the phone what the problem was. Car broke down, leaking coolant, overheated engine, and he diagnosed a busted radiator. I didn't have health insurance anymore, having lost it when I quit my job, but I did have car insurance, which I was convinced I needed more, because my car kept breaking down and the windows kept getting smashed by people looking for change. I hadn't been to the doctor's office in five years. When I hung up, my mom was on the phone with Mr. Kwan, asking him what we should do. I heard his voice come out of the receiver, reciting the address of an auto shop. She repeated the address slowly, spelled out number for number, letter for letter, the way she does even with the simplest words. Mr. Kwan peevishly said the address again, loud and deliberate as if he was talking to a child. She put the phone down and pushed a piece of paper in my face. Stan gave me the name of an auto shop, the best in San Francisco. We have to take the car here, she said. I just called a tow truck. I pointed at the piece of paper and said, this place is too far. The tow truck will just take us to the closest place. Oh, she said, how long do we wait? Probably like an hour. An hour? I can't wait that long. How do I get home? I need to get to my car, don't you? I have to get up early. Can I walk to my car from here? She opened the car door, clomped her right foot on the curb, and started lifting herself up to get out of the car. I thought this save yourself mom was gone. I thought she was replaced with a new mom who would stick by my side by necessity of nothing else. Mom, what are you doing? She whipped her foot inside and yanked the door so it snapped shut. It was like we were trapped inside an oyster. I said, we're miles away from my apartment. You can't walk there. You don't even know where you're going. We were on a street near Golden Gate Park and cars were flying around the bend leaving streaks of rear brake lights. The bay fog rolled over us like milk. I felt the pressure build up in my lungs. Words tried to punch their way out, but I pushed them down where I thought they were better off. I imagined her wandering off and being frightened of the street punks and the hate or stumbling over the homeless people sleeping in the botanical gardens. I was expecting her at any moment to scream. Something like, you've put me in hell, or I should jump off the bridge. Something totally crazy, something that would turn me speechless. But to my surprise, she was silent. Instead, she looked broken, like a twig, crumpled as if someone had stepped on her. I thought she would do anything I told her. She wasn't blaming me now. I wanted the old mom back. This one was confusing me. I wanted the old mom so I could tell her she fucked me up. Then I would be satisfied in hating her. This is someone who used to tell me she got nothing out of being my mother, who told me I was selfish when I wouldn't agree to switch places with her, assuming we could magically switch identities. 
who pushed me in front of a horse when she was afraid it was attacking her, who said it was my fault and that I was spoiled when my dad beat me with a golf club, who removed all the photos of me from the picture frames and replaced them with herself while saying I was fat and ugly, who told me she had a dream that I died because she accidentally poisoned me when she tried to kill my sheepdog, who made me believe she had cancer even though she didn't and that I gave it to her by being mean, who made me run 10 miles with weights on to train for tennis tournaments, who prepped me right before I went on stage for piano competitions by telling me I'd better not mess up, otherwise all my practicing would go to waste. If this is someone who will beg you to trust her, then betray you and later say, why do you think I'm against you? Don't change now, I thought. Don't be nice to me. Please, give me the old mom. I'll take her instead. I need her. I need her because no one else can see me. No one is so penetrating yet painfully oblivious. If she goes away, I'm afraid I won't know who I am. As we sat in my oyster car, I said, you were just gonna leave me here by myself. She made a scoffing sound. No. Yes, you are, I said. My name is Daniel Long. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the people from the Center for Fiction uh, for having me, especially Noreen and uh, Kristen. Uh, the Center for Fiction is very special to me, aside from this grant. I really learned how to write in this room, uh, pretty, actually pretty close to where I'm sitting today, uh, thanks to Mr. Gordon Lish, studying with some great people like Mitchell Jackson, Rob Todd. Uh, so it's uh, sort of like honey for me to, to be here tonight. Uh, I'm going to read the very beginning of a very long piece. Um, there might be things you should know. Uh, I have no intention of telling you those things. <laughs> uh, they didn't give me a lot of time for chit chat, so I better get started. Um, I wrote this myself. <laughs> Picture an old dead field. Shivering cotton in late December. Behold a slat work house sunk deep into that same dead field, shedding off wood smoke and meat smoke and cuts of sallow light. The house surrounded on three sides by frozen water seeped and hardened into the lowlands, mucking each hillock and furrow into a cold amber that threatens the back door. Scarves of hoar fog and sleep. The kind of evening you could beat a wife against. Men in boots and tall hats stand on the front porch and watch wind whips of ice eddy across the great frozen slabs. They watch gropal blow across the sludge in thick pockets where tadpoles encrust each fissure with unformed dyes and tails that will never blossom. Amphibian, protean, still born in the primordial Isis. They stand next to their brothers and think lonely thoughts of bygone days. They think of girls in sundresses, of a childhood dog buried under a thatch of hackberry trees, snout down and rotting into salt. One brother recalls a slender harlot he saluted on a street corner in downtown Tulsa. She did not need to raise her eyes to become regal and infamous in his heart. A coyote on the outskirts mules deep heartbreak from a throat box stacked with predatory sounds. Their eyes feature him now, perch-eared and sniffing for blood as he slinks low along the crop rows between a poultry coop and the oil drums where we burned our trash. This is how I got born. No angels or prophets or wise eastern kings chasing starlight toward the haystacks of Middle Bethlehem. Just a parcel of uncles chewing tobacco on the front porch, all dead within the year. The youngest at the window watching my mother, spread eagle on the kitchen table, chewing on ice chips and rags. The rest staring wide-eyed and silent into the dark expanse, having never seen the snow. They beheld it as if it were the legend of snow. But this is not my birth. 
This is my conception of my birth. This is my mother spread out bloodier and hardier than a discarded Christ, sugar and milk baked into her skin. This is my father in those halcyon days before the flood, a man who knew his way around a carburetor, a stiff arm, a pork knuckle, a man who could turn a screw. Do you miss the one you can never have back? I call you as Lazarus. I raise you from the dead. It unsettles a man's guts what you will find buried in his own mud. The tenant farm and the fields we tilled were wedged in a dried strip of river valley that had changed hands as the war spoils of the Spanish and the French, the Comanches and the Republic of Texas. Indian territory, robber's roost, the land of the six-shooter, the slaughter ground of a hundred nomadic tribes who roamed the earth in the dark times before forgiveness was invented. A place in the gut of the American West fashioned like a corroded war hatchet, plagued by dust bowls and bull weevils and further depleted into show tunes. The locals say that Oklahoma is just like the musical, except with more guns and meth. <laughs> I would say that's mostly right. Hundreds of years of place where outlaws nested and plotted and murdered amongst their kith, boozed and fucked and spilled their seed deep into wars. History books filled with dead ghosts who wrote their autobiographies in blood across the saloon mirrors and horse stalls of melting country towns, pinning their epitaphs in gunmetal. Where Custer gunned down Arapahoes and Kiowas at an oxbow of the Washita River, dividing his command and ordaining his tragic flaw. Where the U.S. Army taught Bill Hickok and Bill Cody how to mop and polish boots, how to shoot a gun. Geronimo chained at that fort as a beloved war prisoner until his dying year, leather-faced and signing autographs for children while he prattled tales of murder with a sweet smile. All the world captor and captive, a dark synod of granite peaks growing bald upon easterlies in the light of the morning star, etched with the loose glyphs and runic penmanship of a late cabal, a forgotten cipher to Confederate bankrolls and ingots, Jesse James lost gold, where Machine Gun Kelly laid low until Alcatraz, where Clyde Barrow shot the life out of his first lawman, a deputy belching animus and organ blood in the lee of a scattering country dance hall as damsels in calico screech and tug him by his name. How the last thin songs did whisper from his eyes. Women in black dresses. The body of pretty boy Floyd arriving by boxcar from Ohio, stripped of his twin 45s. The Salisaw boy returning pickled and ugly to the largest funeral in state history, like a prodigal fallen king. Oh, how the dead did ride. I want to thank you. <laughs>